uh, our next talk uh, will be from Bruno, and he he will talk about PHP and serverless PHP. I think it will be a fun one, and I think we can start this one. I don't think he'll enter now. Maybe maybe he enter to as, uh, answer questions, but I think we can start his talk then. And... Hi guys. Um, first of all, nice to meet you all, and thank you very much for taking the time to be part of today of. Uh, of this conference. And today we will be talking about building a serverless PHP Laravel application using Laravel Vapor. And the buzzword of maybe two years ago or a year and a half ago, serverless. Uh, these are the contents that we're going to go through, uh, explaining a little bit of traditional systems architecture. It's going to be a bit boring for the more senior guys, but it is important to talk a little bit about it to the more junior guys or mid-levels that are not aware how things were structured in the past. And we're going to go through some of the contents uh, that uh, AWS offers for you to glue all of this together and use serverless in the end. And then in the end, of course, not everything is a silver bullet. So we're going to talk a little bit about advantages and disadvantages of a serverless architecture. First of all, my name is Bruno. I'm a wannabe front-end developer. I work at Codoto.com and I am originally from Brazil. As I said, I work at Codoto and basically what we do is um, to make it easy for you to organize IT meetups in your city or in your region. I would highly advise you to check it out. Currently, we are more operating, operating in Zagreb, but we have plans of expanding a little bit to Lisbon uh, in the next year or so. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about traditional system architectures, how web systems were architected before. Well, everything before was, everything was dumped into a single server. So you would have your web application database and maybe even cache, everything in the same server. And of course, user one, two, three, and user N would make the request directly to this web application. Well, then the second one, that uh, started to appear because of the problems that he brought to the, f uh, the first one. We're going to talk a little bit about later on. It was, we separated these servers now or these applications. So the first one would have a web application and a database in a completely different server. And the users would make a request to a web application. And then the web application would interact to the database. Well, Things got a little bit more complicated and it was needed to break even more the application. So we went to, we are entering in the realm of, you have the breakup of the front end, the back end and database. So right now we have a front end app uh, and then we have, would have in another server or even in the same server, a REST API, a GraphQL, for example, with your web application. Uh, and then this REST API or GraphQL would uh, talk directly to your database. And the several users that would make the request would make the request to the front-end application, and then the front-end web application would do the rest. Well, there are many other stories here that we could talk about, microservices and many other more, but right now for this presentation, it's not really that important. So what are the problems with this traditional systems architecture? Uh, and we're going to be talking a, bit, a little bit about scaling, over-provision, and many more. So let's go back to our last architecture that we saw, where everybody would make a request to the front-end application. Front-end application would talk to your REST API or your GraphQL application, and the GraphQL or the REST API would talk to the database. And let's focus a little bit more here on this REST API GraphQL. There are several problems here that we can um, that we can see. We can over provision this, so you can rent a server for with five gigabytes of RAM, but in the end of the day, you're just using one gigabyte of RAM. Uh, this is a single point of failure. If this goes down, you will have problems. Uh, whenever you want, whenever you over provision your your servers, you're gonna end up paying more than what you should. Um, you have to manage the server, of course. It will be harder to scale. We will need a competent team to make sure that you do not break things while scaling. 
you need to pay for DevOps, of course, and the server may be physically located away from the users. So the server might be in the United States, a guy from Australia make a request to your server, it's gonna take two seconds, a second and a half. So <clears throat> what is serverless? How do we turn servers or ser how do we turn server management into someone else's problem? Well, the definition is serverless is a cloud native development model that allow developers to build and run applications without having to manage servers. There are still servers involved, but the, um, the whole complexity is abstracted away from, from the developer. And a cloud provider, in this case, we're going to be talking about AWS, takes care of the provisioning, maintaining, and scaling the server infrastructure for you. Developers only need to worry about developing their application. And in the architecture, very simplified, it is this. Users make a request to a single endpoint, and then under that, you're going to have a bunch of Docker containers that are going to be spawned as soon as it, a request is, uh, is received. There are several uh, companies that use this, uh, this, um, this architecture, such as Netflix, Coca-Cola, and so on, and using it in production as well. So what is function as a service? How we pay only for what we use? Well, FAST or function as a service, it's an event-driven computing execution model where developers write logic that is deployed in containers and fully managed by the platform and then executed on demand. What does this mean? You write your application, you write your code, you ship it somewhere, and usually it can be in a Docker container or some other formats. And as soon as a request is made, a function is going to be evoked and you're literally going to pay only for what that, the time that function ran. So no more over provisioning your servers. So <clears throat> to talk about a little bit how we glue everything together or how we build this serverless uh, uh, application, it is important to understand some of the services that AWS offers. And we're not gonna be talking too deeply about them. We're just gonna tell them, we're just gonna talk uh, what they do in general. So the first one is Amazon A RDS. It's basically a collection of, of services that make it simple to set up, create, scale, and uh, databases in the cloud. You can choose several popular engines as Amazon, uh, Aurora, uh, MySQL, and Postgres, and so on and so on. The second one is for us to manage our queues. Um, we have Amazon Simple Queue Services, which basically, um, as it says, is a fully, management, uh, fully managed message queuing service that enables you to decouple and scale microservices, distributed services, and serverless applications as well. So Amazon completely takes out that complexity that usually we would have to manage our own queues. Uh, the third one is Amazon S3. It's a basically, you can think of as your file system. It's not exactly the same, but it, if it helps to make some sense into it. Uh, the next one, it would be Amazon Simple Email Service. Uh, it's cost effective, super, super freaking cheap to use and offers a very basic service, but the, it does it really, really good. Um, Amazon API Gateway as well. Uh, so as it says, a fully managed service that makes it easy for developers to create, publish, maintain, monitor, and secure APIs at scale. So this is going to be the entry point for our, our application. Someone makes a request to uh, our website, arcodoto.com, for example. The first line that it's going to actually see is this Amazon API gateway. And from this service, we're going to request, uh, sorry, we're going to route uh, the request to the appropriate service. And the most important for us and the serverless ones, it's Lebedus. And in this case, implementing function as a service. By definition, <clears throat> from uh, Amazon, AWS Lambdas, it's a serverless event-driven computing service that lets you run code for virtually any type of application or a backend service without provisioning or managing your servers. You can train Lambdas from over 200 AWS services and software as a service, of course, and only pay for what you use, this being the most important one. So what are some of the Amazon Lambda's use cases that we can think of? Well, the first one is as soon as the photography is taken, for example, 
um, you upload this photography to your Amazon S3 bucket, and then a Lambda is triggered and Lambda can run um, uh, some code that is going to resize this picture into web, uh, mobiles, and tablet sizes. Another one uh, more to the, um, uh, to the IoT guys, it's, uh, for example, tractor sensors that send uh, data to Amazon Kinesis and it captures the stream, an AWS Lambda runs the code and an order is automatically placed for replacement parts, for example, if something is going wrong with the, with, with the tractor. Another one is user post um, a status update, for example. <clears throat> it's run, it, it, it went to Amazon API Gateway, AWS uh, Lambda runs this um, and create basically trends that can be uh, sent to your user friends and, um, and update their notifications as well. So how does, it is important to, to, to see how does H, um, how handling HTTP requests in Laravel happens. So as it's very simple, um, for the junior guys, when you make an HTTP request, you send a request, you receive a response. A lot of things happen in the middle, but not important for us. And the only code that we're actually going to see today is this one. This is how Laravel handles your HTTP requests. You send a request, a lot of things happen in the middle. Um, services are, are skeletons of services are created. And then in the end, a response is sent back to the client. So instead of this, where we would have a single server, where we have several users making requests to it, we would have, or this, as we said before, we would have this, a users or every users make a request to um, your endpoint. In this case, it would be a Lambda. The code runs, the code that runs in the AWS Lambda is your responsibility as a developer. Everything that happens below that, the server management, matching, patch, patching, and all the difficulties of managing servers are the responsibilities of Amazon. And how does all of this work? You would think that it's, uh, you would have to set up everything by yourself. Luckily, we have a service called Laravel Vapor. This is not being sponsored, by the way. <laughs> so how do we glue all of these services together? Well, Laravel Vapor is a serverless deployment platform for Laravel and powered by AWS. Uh, the main things about it is that it provides you on-demand, auto-scaling, and zero maintenance. No more you have to waste a lot of your time trying to understand what is wrong with the servers. So just to give an example, what would look like a high-level overview of Kodoto, which is using Laravel Vapor to deploy uh, our changes and to run our, our whole backend infrastructure? Well, a user make a request. As soon as you make a request, it goes to our Amazon API Gateway. This Amazon API Gateway routes this request to an Amazon Lambda, as we can think here, like kind of like a web server. Um, an Amazon ECS, the container registries from, from Amazon service, it uh, spawn up a new container for us. And this container is going to run our code. And this code is going to interact with us send an email, for example, or create or send something to the queue. And the Amazon Lambda, for example, is going to talk directly to the SQL proxy that is going to handle the connections that we have. And it's going to talk to an Amazon RDS. And for the crons and consoles commands that we actually have running on the background, uh, we have another AWS Lambda uh, running as well. And it makes much easier for uh, everything to run smoothly. So you must be thinking, right? It must take a lot of time to configure all of this. And well, yum is the response to this. It's super simple to configure all of this. For us in Laravel, this is our configuration file. We just have a yum that we set up the environments that we want. In this case, we have one called production and another one called staging. And we can set up all our configurations. Uh, what is the domain of our, um, of our project, the memory that we need for each AWS Lambda, 
uh, the storage, if we would like to have an S3 storage, a database, a database proxy, and so on and so on. So it is important to talk a little bit how serverless can help early stage companies. And the most important part is to cut costs. Currently in Kodoto right now, I think that we are around 80 to $100 per month. Um, and if we would opt, opt into a server architecture, we would probably be paying like double what, what, what we are paying right now. So what are the four main points for me personally, how servers help us maintain a lower cost? No DevOps. We do not need to have a DevOps guy. My understanding of servers are not the best one, and I'm sure there are hundreds of people that are much more knowledgeable than me, and we do not have to pay them to, to do this. Uh, no time management. So the servers, I do not need to manage servers. We save, save a lot of time, which we can basically reuse this time into developing the application itself. Affordable pricing. Um, yeah, currently for, for Atlantis, we're spending around $5 a month. What's costing more is database and other things. Uh, the scaling is much easier, so we do not need to lose hours trying to understand how we're going to scale this. And of course, uh, we do not need to take into account the high traffic uh, times in Kodoto. Usually meetups happen between six to eight. So during that time, uh, we need to have more powerful servers. But in this case that we use serverless, we do not have to worry about those. AWS scales for us automatically. So what are the advantages of serverless architecture? Well, the first one, as we said before, no server management. You do not need to spend time on it. Reduce costs. You pay literally for what you use. There is no reason here to over-provision things and you end up paying for more than what you're using. Uh, it is scalable as fuck. You can scale your infrastructure to thousands of servers in seconds. And the code, uh, code closer to the end user. AWS has several endpoints around the world and several uh, data centers as well. So you can take advantage of deploying the code closer to your, um, to your main users or even deploy to several locations. So if a guy make a request on the United States, he's probably going to get a server in the United States instead of getting the one in Europe. And as everything, it's not a super bullet. What are the disadvantages of a serverless architecture? Well, the first one is testing and debugging. It becomes harder and you need to be more careful how you develop your application. If you do find a bug because you have several services um, running together, it is a bit harder to actually debug your application and testing as well. Um, you cannot have long running process. Amazon Lambda allows only a maximum of 15 minutes running time. So if you need to do something that is more than 15 minutes, you will need to find uh, a, different, uh, a different approach to this problem. Uh, the performance may be affected. In this case, cold starts. Laravel Vapor solves this problem by allowing you to constantly make requests to your application every 30 seconds, every, every 50 seconds, so that whenever a real user makes a request, uh, Amazon, AW, Amazon Lambda already has a container very close to running and you do not, you're not affected by cold starts. And the last one and super important, especially for early companies, it's vendor lock-in. So if you develop your whole application around AWS, there's no standard between all of the different cloud, uh, cloud providers. If you would like to switch from your AWS Lambdas into a Google platform, for example, you can't. It's going to be very hard for you and it's going to be very costly as well. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the time. And if we have any questions, feel free to, uh, to ask them. Thank you.